Hi, I'm Phnom. Hi, I'm Martis. And we're the hosts of Future Future, where two designers talk about the future of everything. We're in the business of turning science fiction into reality for a better future. And today, we're going to talk about conceptual design. So when one thinks of conceptual design, we'll probably have sci-fi movies going through our heads or very sophisticated things about the future. But uh, in terms of industrial design, conceptual design is where you start. You know, you start with thinking about ideas of how to use a technology or how to use a product and how to revolutionize an industry. I feel like it's uh, like the idea of starting with a napkin, right? Napkin sketch. We all understand that idea of we're sitting around, something pops up in our head, we get real excited, we sketch it down. Yeah, and conceptual design can go all the way to very sophisticated 3D files with color applications and all that. What conceptual design means is that it is an idea that is put in a form that can be handed off to people to develop develop it, right? And the more precise you are with your conceptual design, the better results. To be honest, in conceptual design, that is the best part. In my opinion, that's where all the magic happens. And this is great because you can go loose and very wild with your ideas. And we, in brainstorming conceptual ideas, we try to say, you know, don't restrict anyone. Everything is okay. We're not going to criticize. We're just going to share and really develop these wild ideas that would never really make it into reality. But would they? It is extremely important to create a safe space for designers and any type of creatives in the room to put down ideas that they're not ashamed of. Things that sound completely crazy, but might have a small nugget of reality. And these ideas should always communicate something. They communicate an idea, a process, a thought, and it's all about storytelling. Developing a, a very loose story that gets more fine-tuned as you get closer to the final product that's released on the market. So put yourself in the shoes of a company that hires designers to come up with conceptual ideas. They don't want something that's already out there. They don't want something boring. They want something that is going to make them dream, that's going to inspire them to do more and more interesting ideas. They want ideas that are patentable. They want ideas that really uh, are at the forefront of their industry. But when we do this, we don't just, as I said, reach out there wild and go crazy uh, a little bit. But what we do is we frame it with a little bit of uh, usability. We think about uh, the market. We think about the opportunity, maybe sales. We think about the stakeholders, you know, the, the company, the brand, uh, the people who might be buying it. And there's a lot of different factors that loosely start to get woven into this bigger story. So everything is about asking questions surrounding yourself with the right people and collaborating. Designers cannot create wonderful ideas that become reality by themselves. They need other people to turn these into reality. A typical conceptual design process involves one, research and definition. We need to understand in which context we're designing this, who we're designing for, and uh, what is going to sell. Phase number two is concepting, is putting down on paper, on a computer, the different shapes and products and usabilities and, uh, and prototypes that are going to help us push the boundaries of how far the conceptual design can go. And then once we have an idea, we start refining it. Um, that's when all the details of uh, design language and, um, and uh, reality uh, can be integrated in the design. So it can be presented in a way uh, that is uh, realistic. And then finally, delivery. We need, as designers, to create files that can be uh, translated to uh, the technical teams, to manufacturers, in a way that can be comprehensive, but also limit um, the misinterpretations of intent. And we do a lot of, uh, we'll call them frameworks and tools that we use to define these things, to define this language. So CMF would be one of them. Colors, materials, and finish. So when we uh, translate an idea of a product, we can say we define this color with a Pantone matching system or other matching system that defines its exact color and everyone across the globe knows exactly what it means. Another way of doing it is PSD, right, Phenom? What's yeah. that? 
PSD is proportions, surfaces, and details. So when we think about the design language that represents a brand, think about a brand that you like. What kind of forms, what kind of colors, what kind of finishes, what kind of surface transitions do they represent product after product? The more consistent you are in representing a brand, the more people uh, connect to it and are more willing to buy from it. We need all these tools like CMF and PSD to communicate our ideas so everybody's on the same page. And we put these in a umbrella that we call design language. And when we have a design language that can carry on throughout the process, everybody's on the same page. And the beautiful thing about a design language, it isn't always limited to, let's say, your individual product that you're working on at the time. Oftentimes, it's an even larger umbrella that's a design language for the entire brand. And this is really, really valuable to make sure uh, all your products are consistent throughout the life and the family of the brand. So as you're developing conceptual design, there are a few things to keep in mind. One, as you're developing the form in a drawing uh, sketch or in, uh, in CAD, always print it out and test it. Testing often will help validate new ideas, especially ideas that have never been touched before. That's very important. Two, never consider anything final. So final is what we call in design the F word. Uh, we have a um, uh, engineering partner who actually has this bucket in which we have to drop a dollar every time we use the F word. No design is final until we cut the tool. It will be refined again, again, and again through the process of conceptual design and uh, uh, design for manufacturing until it's done. I'm pretty good at dropping those F-bombs, I'm not going to lie. And regardless of what you do, always work to scale. If you're designing a very, very small product or a very, very large architecture, always make sure that the human scale is there to tell you, what well, is it too big? Is it too small? Is it too bobbly? Is it too rectilinear, right? Uh, everything in life is about proportion and design is about inviting people in rather than scaring them away. That's right. So when we're concepting new ideas, we keep it loose, we refine it, we really bring a lot of value to the client. This is what they pay us for. They pay us to go out and really find out those unique interactions and unique ways of relating to a product, an idea, a customer in a way that wouldn't be uh, easily revealed if we went just took you know, engineering right to manufacturing. We have to do these very loose kind of wild ideas and uh, opportunity mining along the way. So thank you for joining us again today on this creative journey and we look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye.